Hello guys, welcome to Today in History. My name is Sotonye Afiasimha. So, the 16th of October, let's roll back the blind, let's get cracking. On this day in 1758, this man here, called Noah Webster, he was an American lexicographer. He was instrumental in giving American English a dignity and vitality of its own. He was born. He was born on this day in 1758. His American Dictionary of the English Language, which was published in 1828, was the first dictionary to give comprehensive coverage of American usage. So American usage of the English language. So born on this day in 1758, Noah Webster, American lexicographer, instrumental in giving American English its dignity and vitality. On this day, in 1828, by your pardon, the American Webster's Dictionary was published for the first time. Okay, let's move on to the year 1793. Marie Antoinette was guillotined on this day. So after the French Revolution began, Marie Antoinette, Queen Consort of Louis XVI, was targeted by agitators who, enraged by her extravagance and attempts to save the monarchy, was ultimately guillotined on this day in 1793. Now, on the 21st of September 1792, the monarchy was abolished. Her trial began on the 14th of October, so that was two days ago, obviously hundreds of years back. That was in 1793, and two days later, Marie Antoinette was convicted by the Revolutionary Tribunal of High Treason and executed by guillotine on the Place de la Revolution. Now, a little side note on the invention of the guillotine. Apparently, um, a pregnant lady was walking past, so before the invention of the guillotine, there was a lady who was pregnant, was walking past, and um, she heard a man screaming, so a man who has been executed by a more um, macabre um, process, um, where I think it was a torture, um, kind of like um, a baseball bat. Imagine a baseball bat with um, spikes on it. Now, don't get, you know, just go check this out. I might be wrong. And that being used all over a human being's body. So this man was screaming until he passed out and died, obviously. And this lady was pregnant. And guess whose pregnancy she was carrying? Or not whose pregnancy, guess who she was carrying? The man who was to be named, who the, the guillotine was to be named after. And his name happened to be, his last name happened to be guillotine without the E at the end. And he became a medical doctor. You know, he became... Um, um, he mixed, you know, he mingled with the political class of France. He um, didn't like the death penalty in France at the time, so he canvassed for the abolition of the death penalty, realizing that that wasn't going to happen, decided to um, make a suggestion for a quicker and easier, a quicker way to die, you know. Obviously, if someone is beheaded very quickly, the person doesn't feel any pain. He was a physician, so he knew how the body functioned. So... Fast forward, the guillotine was invented after several refusals because a lot of people didn't want to be connected with um, something that was going to take people's lives. But eventually, um, the inventor, not the doctor now, not the, the guy who this was named after, someone else invented it and, and got somebody to, to do his dirty work, you know, in quote. So, guillotine was invented and that was the mode of execution in France for two centuries before the death penalty was um, abolished in 1981 in France, believe it or not. You know, 1981, I found that astounding that at 19, early 1981 people were still guillotined in France. But anyway, so that's a bit um, of the history of the guillotine and uh, Marie Antoinette, obviously, on this day was executed. Right, let's move on to 1846. On this day, William Thomas Green Morton, pictured right here, administering ether anesthesia. So that was demonstrated for the first time on this day 
he used Ephra as a gener general anesthetic before a gathering of physicians in, at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. So he is credited with gaining the medical world's acceptance of surgical anesthesia. So again, that's William Thomas Green Morton, who administered Ephra anesthesia for the first time on this day at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Let's move on to 1847, so exactly one year later, Charlotte Bronte, English novelist who wrote under the name Curia Bell, published Jane Eyre on this day. It's became a classic and noted for giving new truthfulness to the Victorian novel. So that's Charlotte Bronte, who published Jane Eyre on this day in 1847. Let's move on to the year 1859. So 12 years later, John Brown I found this very, very interesting. So John Brown pictured here, he was a militant abolitionist he made his legendary raid on the U.S. arsenal at Harpers Ferry on this day in 1859. He was born on the 9th of May 1800 and was executed for his crime, in quote, on the 2nd of December 1859. Brown, who said that speeches, sermons and petitions were accomplishing nothing, that moral suasion is hopeless, saw violence as unfortunately necessary if slavery in the United States were to be eliminated. An intensely religious man who at one point studied for the ministry, Brown felt that, his, that this work was the work of God and that the work that God had called him to do. He said repeatedly after he was captured that he was following the golden rule. So, he first gained national attention when he led small groups of anti-slavery volunteers during the bleeding Kansas crisis of the late 1850s. He was dissatisfied with the pacifism of the organized abolitionist movement. These men are all talk, he said. What we need is action. Action. So this is John Brown. And, you know, it reminded me of the song. I, I just wonder, that song that goes, John Brown's body lies mouldering in the clay. And this is a John Brown. This is a John Brown, believe it or not, that the song um, was written for, if you like. So, lyrics right here. So you can see, John Brown's body lies a mouldering in the grave. John Brown's body. It's called the Battle Hymn of the Republic, I think. The American Republic, in this case. So go check it out on YouTube. I'm not sure I can play it, but there we go. John Brown's body here. Let me see. Probably just play a few seconds of it. There you go. I'm going to end it there now. So go check it out. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His soul goes marching on. Okay. On that note, let's move on to the next... Important event on this day, 1890, Michael Collins, an Irish statesman, was born. He was an Irish revolutionary, a soldier and politician who was a leading figure in the early 20th century Irish struggle for independence. He was chairman of the provisional government of the Irish Free State from January 1922 until his assassination in August 1922. Collins was born in Woodfield, County Cork, the youngest of eight children, and his family had Republican connections reaching back to the 1798 rebellion. So again, go check it out. There's anything I've said here. Obviously, I cannot elaborate on everything stated here. So you can go check out what the 1798 rebellion was all about and find out more about Michael Collins, who was born on this day in 1890. He was executed at the age of 32 in August 2208-22. Let's move on to the year 1908. Enver Hoxha, his name, 
former president of Albania, politician obviously. He served as the first secretary of the Party of Labour of Albania from 1941 until his death in 1985. He was also a member of the Politburo of the Party of Labour of Albania, chairman of the Democratic Front of Albania, commander-in-chief of the armed forces from 1944 until his death. He served as the 22nd Prime Minister of Albania from 1944 to 1954 and at various times served as Foreign Minister and Defence Minister of People's Socialist Republic of Albania as well. So this is Enver Hoxha, former Albanian president, who was born on this day in 1908, he died in 1985 at the age of 77. 1968, history was made on this day. Tommy Smith and John Carlos. This was the day in Mexico City that this event happened. So, so-called Black Power salute. Um, so American sprinters Tommy Smith and John Carlos gave a Black Power salute for which they were later ordered to leave the game. So that happened again on this day in 1968. I'm going to give you a bit of a background on this event. So in addition, Smith, Carlos and the Australian silver medalist who is pictured there in this picture, they all wore human rights badges on their jackets. So apparently, um, Peter Norman, the Australian, was asked what he could do to support their cause. And they suggested that he wore the human rights badge uh, on his jacket to support them because they were going to do the same. Um, so obviously they went to the podium to get their medals and the African-Americans here raised their fists for uh, commemorate the Black Power salute. And, you know, this was not just about Black Power, but it was about... Um, drawing attention to the plight of the underprivileged around the world, which, of course, a, a lot of black people, a higher percentage of African-Americans and black people were subjected to a lot of racial abuse, a lot of um, prejudice, you know, because just because of their color. Um, and obviously those who were, um, couldn't get by from day to day, those who were suppressed, oppressed, um, this was a fight for them as well. So he said later, 30 years later, in his book uh, titled Silent Gesture, he revised his statement that the gesture was not a black power salute per se, but rather a human rights salute. The demonstration is regarded as one of the most overtly political statements in the history of the modern Olympics. They agreed to use the medal wins as an opportunity to highlight the social issues roiling the United States at the time. Racial tensions were at a height and the civil rights movement had given way to the Black Power movement. Now, the thing about the civil rights movement that these guys were fighting against as well is that they felt that the civil rights movement were too um, too slow, too humane. There's, there was too much talk. You know, it's it's sort of ties in with John Brown as well. So that's interesting that you know these two events are happening about on the same day, hundreds of years later. Um, it was, and I don't think obviously it, these guys didn't even realize the connection between them and John Brown, who interestingly was a white American, you know, fighting for their cause, you know, and they were to come obviously hundreds of years later. It was interesting how these things tie in. And I've done a few videos where there have been interesting coincidences, but today has today's just another one. So um, yeah, so the civil rights movement. Um, interestingly, this was a few months after Martin Luther King was assassinated as well. So this happened the same year. He was assassinated in April. This was happening in October, the 16th of October, 1968. So these guys um, felt that. Um, Martin Luther King and his followers, you know, were being too peaceful, you know, that um, for, for things to change, you have to, sometimes you have to resort to violence. You have to resort to force, you know, to make sure that things change, you know. Anyway, so this is history. Um, 
That's, I'm just going to report what happened. I'm not going to really give my opinion on that, on this matter in this. I, I will do. I will give my opinion, change my mind now, that there's sometimes force is needed. But you need to choose your battles wisely. You need to know when to use force and when to abstain from using force. Nelson Mandela, when he started his struggle, he started by using a violent, you know, opposition. But towards the end of his struggle, he decided to copy Gandhi, you know, peaceful um, resistance rather than force. And I believe that in the end, a bit of both is needed. A bit of both is needed. But yes, I, I agree that force is needed sometimes to effect lasting change. Okay, let's move on to the year 1977. John Clayton Mayer, born on this day, pictured here. Who is he? He's an American singer-songwriter, guitarist, and record producer. He was born in Bridgeport, Connecticut on this day. John Mayer, for short. Born on this day, American singer-songwriter. Born in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Last but not least, Laszlo Pap. That's him here. Who was he? Never heard this name before until today. And... You won't believe how how many medals this guy won and how many he won back to back. So Hungarian boxer Laszlo Pap, who was the first three-time Olympic boxing champion, winning gold medals in 1948, 1952, and 1956, so consecutive Olympics. He died on this day at the age of 77. It was a remarkable run of Olympic boxing supremacy in that of his 13 Olympic fights, he won 12 of them without losing a round. Without losing a round. Can you believe that? He won 12 out of 13 Olympic fights without losing one round and dropped only a single round in his last final to Torres, a boxer called Torres. There would not be another triple gold medalist for 20 years when Teofilo Stevenson won three, followed by Felix Savon as the latest one of the three men to accomplish the feat. So, that's history for you for the 16th of October, as reported by my humble self, Sotoni Afiasima. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Today in History. Please join me tomorrow, October 17th, for another informative, hopefully interesting edition of Today in History. Like this video by giving me a thumbs up if you like it. Um, share also with your family and friends. Do not forget to subscribe. Click the notification bell so that you receive updates of my video uploads. And I shall see you tomorrow. Stay safe. Bye-bye.